Our speaker this morning is Dr. Timothy Ralston, Professor of Pastoral Ministries. Dr. Ralston brings a rich background to the classroom, a background in church ministry, a background in the academy as well. He served as pastor in Ontario and director of adult education, both uh, there and in the United States. He's an active member in the North American Academy of Liturgy and Evangelical Homiletic Society. His research in New Testament manuscripts and worship has taken him into a wide variety of settings and produced numerous scar, 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 hello, <laughs> academic articles. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys were singing, I thought, if, if I don't sing in a group like that, maybe I could do the ch -ch -ch boom, you know, stuff that uh, goes with that. And scholarly articles, that's the word. His teaching interests include preaching and worship and spirituality. His research interests include the manuscripts, liturgical theology and history, and the history and practice of Christian spirituality and spiritual direction. To relax, he is a master scuba diver trainer with the Professional Association of Diving Instructors and uh, enjoys exploring sunken ships and underwater sites uh, throughout the world. Uh, he's uh, technically on sabbatical, so I was teasing that uh, when he comes back, we're going to have to give him a day off, uh, but uh, Chaplain Bill asked him to come, and so would you join me in welcoming Timothy Ralston to our platform this morning. He'd been a church planter for three years, quite successfully formed the congregation, and uh, now he was engaged in their care. And one day, Eugene Peterson bumped into a young woman. Her name was Marilyn. She was a 20-something. She'd shown up at the congregation, a lawyer, a mom, a wonderful wife, but she was having some difficulty, and he went to visit her in the hospital. He says, I was still getting acquainted with her. She was in for tests, hadn't been feeling well, and the doctors were having difficulty diagnosing anything. I was in the habit of asking someone who gave me any kind of opening, would you like, me to talk, would you like to talk with me about that? Um, but I said nothing. Another month went by, and I visited her again, this time in her home. And feeling cautiously safe, I ventured, is there anything you want me to do? Marilyn hesitated. Then shyly, yes, I've been thinking a lot about it. Would you teach me to pray? I'd been a pastor of my new congregation for three years, and this was the first time anyone had asked me to teach them to pray. I reflected on the irony, the work I was most equipped for, that I most wanted to do, what most pastors for most of our 20 centuries expected to do and did, had not been expected of me, until Marilyn asked. What alarmed me was that I was slipping into the habit of identifying and dealing with my congregation as problems, reducing them to things I might be able to do something about, or at least refer to someone who could. And incrementally, I'd been shifting from being a pastor, dealing with God's people and God's work in their lives, to treating them as simply people who had problems I could handle. I was trading in the complexities of spiritual growth in a congregation for the reduced dimensions of addressing problems that could be named and understood. I'd been doing this quite a lot. I don't think the problem that Gene Peterson talks about was unique or special to him. I don't know, when I was a pastor, I began to fumble around a lot, and I began to look for seminars that would teach me how to deal with this situation, or a workshop that would deal with that. Maybe there's a book on the shelf, or a manual that will help me do my job better, that will help me grow my church, we'd be more successful in ministry. And I got to admit, I too got pretty distracted by mechanisms, by tools, by somehow trying to make it work by the resources that other people had put at my disposal. I don't know about you, but I, I think we do have a problem as Americans. You know, we're, we're great at 
building things, solving problems, innovating, being creative. And if we're not careful, that kind of begins to wash over into the work we do for God. You know, if we just have the right method, we can get a guaranteed result. If we can just take the Model T down the assembly line with the right people at the right places, adding the right bolts, we'll have a car for every home in America. We'll have a church that grows. We'll have a mission that succeeds. We get distracted. Don't know about you, but I think Jesus' disciples probably had the same problem too. See, there came a time in their ministry when uh, Jesus had sent them out, 70 of them to be exact, and they had gone out and they'd had a blast. And they came back and they said, you know, we are rejoicing in this wonderful success we've experienced. And of course, if they'd been living in 21st century America, Jesus would have immediately have sat them down, codified it into a manual, sent it off to a publishing house, and the kingdom of God would be here. <laughs> but he didn't. Instead, he talked to them a little bit about the burden of the work. And then he took them to a home where two women, one who was burdened in the work and the other who just sat at his feet to listen. And he said, it's not the work. It's the portion you choose, the better portion of sitting at my feet and learning from me. And then in the narrative, the disciples capitalize on that moment by coming to him as he prays. And they ask him a question, the only time it's asked in all of the Gospels, from the one person for whom they should have taken a graduate level course, teach us to pray. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Begin reading at verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard. And it came about that while he was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, if you're like me, you're saying, wait a minute, there's something missing here. Well, you're right. This prayer is also recorded in the Gospel of Matthew as part of the Sermon on the Mount, part of that wonderful manifesto of what it means to live by kingdom values when Jesus is the King. In Matthew, we start with an address, our Father, and then there are three requests and three requests. Luke has a slightly different structure. We begin with the address, then there are two requests, and then there are three requests. But both prayers cover the same ground. And what Luke has left out doesn't change the character of what it means to pray when we are God's people. And in fact, commentators notice that when Jesus talks about them praying, he talks about them as a collective. When y'all pray, do this. And so many have said, well, this is obviously a prayer for the corporate group. Quite true, and that's why Christians for centuries have prayed this as part of their worship. It's an amazing, brilliant synthesis of biblical theology. But it also has a way of reorienting us even to our own praying. And so what I would like to do with you in the next few minutes is explore this as a discussion in a much broader biblical theology. What does it mean to pray if we are Christ's disciples? What should be the foci or the priorities of what we seek? And when we talk about prayer, I, I go back to my mentor on this, Dr. Toussaint, who say, you know, the word pray biblically and in English means ask. So while you might throw a lot of other things into the category of prayer, 
What Jesus is dealing with is one thing. When you come to God with a request that you can't meet yourself and it's up to him to deal with it, what do you ask for? So explore with me for the next few minutes this prayer. You notice it begins with the address, Father. And I'm going to suggest this, just from this one word, I want you to take away these two words. When you pray, ask unselfishly. Saying, wait a minute, where'd you get that? Okay, really simple. I read it into the text. Okay? You know, voodoo exegesis. Well, not really. When you look at the Old Testament, you discover that the relationship of God with his people is often represented as a father with his children. Okay. So we're talking about someone who has a relationship with God. But more than that, the New Testament is going to take it just a little farther. And of course, in the New Testament, we're going to talk about the term of intimacy. And you'll notice that the term of intimacy, you really only can call God your father in the struggle with your own selfishness, in the temptation to do it your way when you say, no, not my will, but thine be done. So when you're willing to say, it's not what I want. I'm coming to you with an open heart, open hands, and I'm willing to take whatever you give. I'm willing to put aside my agendas, my desires. I'm willing to be available to everything you want me to do. Father, I'm your child. I want to be obedient. I want to serve your purposes. So when you pray, pray unselfishly. Very simple. See, I tell people in the spiritual life course, if you, maybe you took it online and you didn't get that lecture, I'm never quite sure what lectures get posted, so, you know, haven't watched myself. You know, I'm like the Hollywood actors. You watch yourself doing something and, oh, it's always disgusting. You know? But prayer, prayer is going to tell you where your priorities are. What you think of God. What you think of yourself. What you ask for can tell you and anybody else who hears you where your heart is spiritually. I'll tell you a little secret. I used to use that as a dating line. Hey, you want to get together and pray? <laughs> There's no faster way to figure out where a girl is spiritually than to sit down with her for a few minutes and pray together. My wife thought that was the coolest thing she'd ever heard. No guy had ever picked her up with that before. Yes. Okay. But that's why. Cuss to the chase. When you pray, begin with an attitude of complete unselfishness. That then gets us into the prayer itself. And may I suggest to you, the next two requests deal with the whole issue of what is God about in the world? And so if I could summarize it, I'd say, when you pray, ask unselfishly for God's reputation. Now, there's two requests here. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And, of course, you can look in the commentaries and they'll say, you know, hallowed be your name. May your name be special and uh, may your rule be established on the earth. But again, let me just take this a little further for you. I spent the last three weeks in Canada. My father died a few years ago. My mother was going blind at the beginning of the summer and we had to find accommodations for her. And I spent the last three weeks going through well, I'll say 30 years of memories and trying to tell mom, I'm sorry, we can't keep that old Bible. No, I'm sorry, those medical receipts for groceries from 1999, or those receipts for groceries for 1999 are no good for tax purposes. You know, I mean, oh, it was just... And then I came across one thing. It's our family crest. I apologize, there are no lions or griffins or eagles, you know, nothing that would make you think we were glorious, you know, knights, errant... Um, no, it's a white shield with three, corns, eight, three acorns on it. <laughs> Gee, thanks. You know. But it's not the shield that captured my attention. See, every family has a motto. The Ralston family motto is fide et marte. Faithfulness and courage. You know what it means is, if I'm on your side, I will not be behind you I'll be beside you. 
If we're fighting together, you can count on me. Anything we move into, I will be there. If I give you my word, I will not back away from it. That's what Ralston is known for. See, when I sanctify the name Ralston, I live up to what it means. And people know that I, my word means something. People know they can count on me. What does God's name communicate? God's name communicates his character, his faithfulness, all of the promises he's wrapped up that he's given to us, saying, this is how I am, this is how I work, this is what pleases me. So to make God's name holy is to ask God to do everything he has promised to do and to be everything he has promised to be. In other words, God, this is a crazy, screwed up, broken world. Would you step into it as its creator and fix it? You promised us you would come and establish justice. Will you come and establish justice? Will you help the person who has no one to defend them? Will you be there for the widow and the orphan? Will you keep your word? And the prayer is, Lord, may the world see that you are the God who you claim to be. And that's why the second request, just simply as it were, adds an exclamation point to it, let your kingdom come. Let the place where your reign, your rule, your character, your word is established be present. See, what I'm really praying for is God's reputation. That he would be all that he claimed to be in my life, in this world. And that I will pray toward that end, that when he reveals himself, he will be shown to be true to be right, to be faithful, to be loving, to be compassionate. He will be the great God that he has always claimed to be through thousands of years of written scripture. Of course, Matthew adds a third exclamation part. Let your will be done, both on earth as it is in heaven. And while they assume, as it were, three different requests by line that they summarize that idea, God, preserve your reputation. By the way, when you read the Old Testament, you discover many times that's exactly how the people of God respond to God. Do you remember when uh, Moses and the children of Israel are at the face of Mount Sinai and the children of Israel are, as, as you know, Cecil B. DeMille shows, at partying lasciviously at the bottom, and God says, listen, I tell you what, let me wipe them out, Moses, and I'll make you sort of my new Abraham. And Moses goes to God, excuse me, God, um, if you do that, you'll make a mockery of the promises you made. You will show yourself to be arbitrary and capricious. You can't do that. Now, that story is more about God testing Moses than about Moses persuading God. Moses is just saying to God, be the God you claim to be. And you'll see that again in the prophets. As you read through the prophets time and time again, you see the cry, God, be who you claim to be in this world. Take the opportunity to manifest you are faithful and you are true and you are loving and you will keep your promises. It's not a new question because even Peter comments, people say, where's the sign of his coming? Come on, nothing's changed. Can we really trust this God? Paul deals with the same question, Romans 9 through 11. Did God throw away Israel? And if he threw away Israel, certainly he has no need to keep any promises he makes to us. Paul in Romans says, <laughs> God's going to keep his promises. Peter says, God's just delaying because in his patience he wants none to perish. God, do what you claim to do. Be who you claim to be. Establish that in this world. Demonstrate you are and you act according to all that you do and say and are. So when you ask, ask unselfishly for God's reputation. I fear that too often our prayers are <laughs> more selfish than that. You know, oh Lord, you know, please heal. Why? 
Well, because shouldn't everybody enjoy a happy and prosperous life? Isn't it a right guaranteed in the Constitution? <laughs> oh, God, you know, deliver the missionaries from persecution. Why? Because nobody deserves to hurt, and those are bad people. And yet, Paul found persecution very liberating. <laughs> the gospel went where it couldn't go before. You see, sometimes we, we pray in ways that are very short-sighted and selfish, that get in the way of God's purpose in the world. That's why one of the greatest gifts of a seminary education is a time to sit back and not just master the details of the text, but to understand the God who stands behind it and makes promises you understand his character. What's important to him as contrasted to you? And therefore, when you pray, you should pray according to what's important to him, not what you think is expedient for the foreseeable future. There's a form of prayer that's a standard for centuries. It's called a collect. And in the collect... You ask God for something, but you must always add after the request, how will this advance his purpose in the world? I love that pattern. The Apostle Paul uses it when he opens his epistles and prayers. He says, I pray for this so that this will happen. That's a collect. It's changed the way I pray because you know, many things I would pray and I couldn't imagine how that's, you know, what, what does that do for God's purpose? So now when I think about what does God what would God do in this situation? What would glorify him? And it makes me modify my request. It makes me think a little more carefully about what I seek from God. The delight is, I don't have to end all my requests with whether it be your will, because I know what God's will is, and I'm praying in conformity to it. Or at least what I understand to be in conformity to what he wants. And I can be specific, not just bless Fred. See, I am praying according to God's reputation. I want it to be established, and that's the way I ask. When my sister was dying a few years ago, several years of, of cancer in the spine, inoperable, they said, the cancer won't kill you. The only way you'll go is if it metastasizes, and it never did. But she was in agony. So I began praying this, Father, before the pain ever gets more than she can bear, before the drugs become too heavy for her to remember or bear witness to you, before she ever violates any commitment she has made to be your faithful witness, please take her. You haven't healed her in these years. I don't believe you are going to. So let her die as a faithful Christian witness. Tough thing to ask for your sister's death. <laughs> Had a conversation with my parents and they said, we, we can't pray that. I didn't expect them to. No parent deserves to bury a child. But the nice thing was God answered my prayer. She burned herself with a heating pad, went into septicemia, septic shock, went into a coma and died a week later. Praise God. She died a faithful witness to the truth. I prayed that God's name would be honored in the death of my sister. And it worked. Did I miss her? You bet. She taught me all the camp songs I ever knew, all the jokes I ever learned. She was a wonderful mentor and friend. Do I still miss her? Yes, I do. But I didn't pray selfishly. I said, God, let your witness through her be honored. So when you pray, ask unselfishly for God's reputation. Well, that's the first two requests, and that brings us to the third request. And when I get to the third request, I, I think of a situation that happened to my family. We were dra driving back to Dallas uh, from Canada. You know, I make my periodic migration up there to experience the cold snow and the A's. Um, but, you know, got back to Tennessee, and it was one day we're stopped in Jackson, Tennessee, and thought, you know, going to get some gas, slight curve in the road, long line of traffic. And we see this uh, black Bronco go tearing by us down the road. 
Okay? I mean, he was, must have been traveling. We were virtually stopped. My wife looked at me, and I kind of looked at her, and we both had the same thought that we voiced, where's a cop when you need him? Okay, where's justice? Oh, God, catch that person. And then I went to turn left into the gas station. The state policeman creamed the front end of my car, bounced off, and at 50 miles an hour went front end into a lamppost, and I watched his car literally disintegrate all around him. You see, in praying for God's justice, we got creamed in the process. <laughs> now, by the way, the guy with the Bronco got caught, but that was by those state troopers up the road. And I also learned that if any you know, policeman goes down, you'll find 35 police cars around you all at once. By the way, we were fine. He went to the hospital. He, fought, he was fine after a couple of days' stay. So miraculously, no one was hurt. But you see, when God steps in to execute judgment, when God is going to make everything right, what about the people who are still here who honor God? You know, the, the tsunamis that flooded over Japan didn't distinguish who they hit. When plagues go across a country, you know, it, it's not like just certain people don't get sick. Everybody's at risk. And so the next three requests deal with the issue of, okay, God, when you dispense your justice, when you demonstrate your perfect character, please make sure each day we have what we need to survive. Give us our daily bread. You know, we don't need a 401k. It's okay if we have a bank account, but that's not important. Minimum wage, well, you know, that would be nice. But Jesus is talking in a world where everybody's a day laborer. Your bank account may be a couple of extra shekels buried in a little pouch in the corner of your house. Retirement is the kids you're raising. Give us today what we need for tomorrow, for each day. And then, of course, he adds to that, forgive us our sins. <laughs> you know, we're a, we're a pretty forgetful people. I mean, it's, it's all too easy to get selfish in the moment and uh, do something that's actually pretty sinful. If you've been married, you know this. You know, your wife says something, your husband says something, and you snap back, and you suddenly realize, oh, gee, I shouldn't have done that. That was a sinful response. Or maybe there was a time you knew there was something you should do and you kind of talked yourself out of it. It was a good thing, it was the right thing, but you rationalized it and you didn't do it. Christians have talked about things we have done which we ought not to have done and the things which we have not done that we ought to have done. It doesn't matter how you want to talk about it, we are sinful people. So, Father, when you come in judgment upon those who are sinners, forgive us. Because we understand you to be a gracious and forgiving God, and we have attempted to model that in our relationships as well. We understand you, and we know you. And then, the third request. Lead us not into temptation. Now, God doesn't tempt people to sin. Okay? Let's put that to rest. The issue is not that God's going to dangle a carrot in front of your nose and see if you'll jump for it and then go, ah, I got you. No, he doesn't do that. But what he does do is he does allow circumstances and situations to come into our lives so that we can demonstrate our fidelity, demonstrate that, no, 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 not the way we want it, but the way God wants it is the most important. That's the temptation. The temptation is, it were, to to follow your own needs and pursuits and accomplish your own things and end up being at odds with what God is doing and therefore you get wiped out with the rest of the people. It's why we find again and again God finds ways to secure those who are His. It's why He took the Israelites to Canaan for 400 years so they would not be infected and destroyed with the Canaanites. It's why He seals the 144,000 in Revelation. Why? So that they will not be destroyed along with the pagan world as God sweeps through in judgment. And so what we're asking God to do in these requests is do what you've always done. Preserve your faithful people in the midst of the judgment, in the midst of the demonstration of your integrity, in the midst of the vindication of your character. 
Don't let us get swept away with everything else that comes across this world to test it, to purify it, to destroy it even. Keep us safe. So we're asking unselfishly for God's reputation and for our preservation. Just that God would not, or God would carefully distinguish and protect us as he works out his will in the world. That doesn't mean that you'll be immune individually from the, the chance events. It doesn't mean that you'll be even immune from persecution, but what it does say is that God promises to protect you. God promises to be there. What you've entrusted unto him, he will not lose. See, all too often I think we, uh, we pray for things that we would like, the things that would make us happy, the things that would help us to be more comfortable in the world, and we forget that it's a broken world anyway. And it's going to be judged by God. And so when you pray in a broken world, ask unselfishly for God's reputation and for your preservation. With that, you can summarize both the Lord's Prayer in Luke and in Matthew. With that, you've got the two great foci of the prayers of the prophets. Oh God, be who you've promised Israel to be, but protect us when you do. That's why I say Jesus' prayer is a genius synthesis of the Old Testament prophets and their theology. May I suggest it ought to be a genius synthesis for us. Something that will guide us as we pray. That we're more concerned about who God is and that he is shown to be faithful than our comfort. And that we are willing to simply, as his people, be preserved from day to day so that the witness he has through us can continue. Gene Peterson writes, An inner resolve began forming within me. I was not going to wait to be asked anymore. In these secularizing times in which I am living, God is not taken seriously. God is peripheral. God is nice, or maybe not so nice, but not at the center. When people want help with parents, children, emotions, they don't ordinarily see themselves as wanting God. But if I'm going to be true to my vocation as a pastor, I can't let the market determine what I do. I will find ways to pray with and for people and to teach them to pray. I'm not going to wait to be asked. I'm a pastor. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful that you are a God who can be trusted, God who does all things well, who has made promises to us about your purpose in the world and how you will accomplish it and that you will accomplish it for you alone are strong enough and big enough to do it. We ask that with the Holy Spirit working within us, our minds would be active so that we would ask only that which conforms to your will unselfishly. And Father, if we are selfish in our request, let at least admit it so that we understand that this, this is not something you are obligated to answer. We pray, Father, we will be more concerned with the demonstration of your character and trustworthiness than our comfort. And that we will not seek more than you have promised, more than food for the day, clothes for our bodies, and maybe just a roof over our head, that our requests will honor you. And to that end, we offer you the prayer that our Savior taught us, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Amen.